One. Hey, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. We are live. Thank you all for being here. Feel free to say hello in the chat. Let us know that you are here. We have a great, great program lined up for you tonight. So uh, welcome to another AAM program designed to help you become a more knowledgeable effective and outspoken advocate for the animals. Tonight, Barbara J. King is with us, author of How Animals Grieve, and she will explore how animals experience grief, fear, love, and relationships, the nature of intersectional grief and ecological grief, how understanding the rich inner life of animals can make us more effective advocates and activists. For the animals. And there will be time for questions and answers with Barbara. So my name is Michelle Granberg. I'm your moderator. I'm a mentor and team member with Animal Activism Mentorship. I am joined by my co-moderator, Alina Sigler, ordained interspecies animal chaplain. AAM is a multinational program supporting seasoned as well as fledgling new activists. Our mission is to empower activists to reach their full potential and equip them with the tools they need to boldly participate in our global animal liberation movement. Founded in 2020, AAM offers a free three-month mentorship program which pairs experienced activists with aspiring activists. Additionally, we offer free educational online programs like this one. We have a podcast called the Animal Liberation Hour and we host large scale in-person activism events around the country. If you're interested in applying to become a mentor or mentee or want to get involved or to donate, please visit our website, animalactivismmentorship.com. So uh, before we begin, a few reminders. Mm -hmm. um, first, a disclaimer a bit. Um, myself and Elena and Barbara are not counselors or psychotherapists. Uh, this is not group counseling or a substitute for medical or mental health care. And um, however, this educational program will not interfere with treatment from any licensed medical or mental health professional. Second, a reminder that this is a safe space. So please be kind and respectful to one another in the chat. Third, a little trigger alert because grief is a sensitive topic and can be triggering to some folks. So just be aware of that and please take care of yourself if you need to step away, that is fine. All righty then. Now we get to introduce our presenter. Barbara J. King is Emerita Professor of Anthropology at William and & Mary and a freelance science writer and public speaker. The author of seven books, including How Animals Grieve, Personalities on the Plate, I have handy. Animals Best Friends, Putting Compassion to Work for Animals in Captivity and the Wild. Barbara focuses on animal emotion and cognition and the ethics of our relationships with other animals. Her book, How Animals Grieve, has been translated into seven languages and her TED Talk on animal love and grief has now received 3.5 million views. You can visit her website and TED Talk on barbarajking.com. I'll put that in the chat. All right, Barbara. So now you can take it away. Well, thank you, Michelle. That's a very generous introduction. And I'd like to greet everyone who is here this evening or will be watching later. Thank you for being here. What a wonderful educational opportunity for us to talk with each other. I say evening because it is already dark evening here in southeastern Virginia, where I live. And my plan for this evening, in conjunction with Michelle and Elena, is to talk for a little less than 30 minutes and then open this up for discussion among us. 
And please keep in mind, if you would, that my remarks are meant to be very informal and to be a springboard for discussion among us. So I'm going to be mentioning some topics that we can take up at greater length later. As you see from my title here, I do want to talk mostly this evening about what I'm thinking of as intersectional grief and how it relates to and is entangled with the work that we do in animal activism. So in my schematics, intersectional grief involves a minimum of three overlapping categories. And the first is the work that I've devoted the last about a dozen years to, and that is documenting the expression of grief by other than human animals. So when a particular animal dies, whether it is in the wild or in our homes or in some type of captivity, and a survivor expresses sorrow through social withdrawal or failure to eat or drink or sleep or a very species specific type of expression of really longing and yearning, that is grief. And we have found, we being scientists working together, grief in a, in a large number of animal species by now. A second category is also an animal category, but I'm also pulling it out and thinking of it a bit separately, and that is human grief. And of course, all of us who have the joy of loving in our lives will also feel at some point in our lives grief. And we also might pluralize this noun from grief to griefs because in human society, of course, there's grief not only for loss of life, but for other things as well. And one of the things we could think about as we talk tonight is the grief that we feel for the terrible violence that's happening in the world right now. I think it's on all our minds and it is a kind of subtext of what I'm thinking about right now. The third category is ecological grief, which I will define formally for you in a minute, but it's the type of sadness and concern that we may feel for the changing earth that we live on. And we could think of this as a climate crisis, also a biodiversity crisis. And these griefs interact. We may feel all of them simultaneously, really, uh, or be involved in helping others who are feeling them if we are activists. So and I'll get more into that in just a moment. So let me start with animal grief. Many people in the public, in science, in activism, in all really walks of life are becoming increasingly aware of the profound ways in which other animals think and feel, feel their lives. And in some cases, animal grief has become really famous and really well known and discussed in the media and thought about. And one case that you all may remember happened in July of 2018 and it's expressed here in the slide on the upper left. This is the orca Talaqua who lost her daughter shortly after birth in the Salish Sea in the Pacific Northwest, and then went on what is now called a 17 day, 1000 mile grief swim. In other words, she did not allow the body of her daughter to slip off her own body in an expression of the deep emotional connection she felt to her daughter. And, you know, we call it this now, a 17-day, 1,000-mile grief swim. But when it was happening, we didn't know what the end point was. She was doing many of the things that I mentioned in my definition of animal grief. Her life was altered. Her travel, her eating, her sleeping was altered. Her emotional expression was altered. And the scientists, activists, and others watching her didn't know what the end point of that was going to be. After 17 days, she did let her daughter's body slip off and continued on with her life and later went on to have a healthy calf 
as she had had in the past. Tahlequah, this orca, put a public face on animal grief in a way that was, if not unprecedented, nearly so. Another pole or axis, if you will, of awareness of animal grief comes with companion animals that we may live with. And I have two cats pictured here, two white sisters that we rescued. We have for many years rescued homeless cats and either house them indoors with us or in a very large outdoor spacious sheltered pen in our yard. And Kaylee on the left and Haley on the right were extremely close sisters who cared greatly for each other. As you can see, they're all white females and they were very prone, unfortunately, to cancer. And Haley on the right died first. And when that happened, we laid her body out on a tarp. And in this group of cats were quite a few, maybe eight or 10 other cats. And the others came up to Haley's body and very closely looked and sniffed and in their own ways touched. And her sister, who'd been so close to her, sat and stared and stared for quite a long time and did not approach. And I've thought a lot about that in my attempt to think about different ways of animals expressing grief rather than using only our own human standard to decide what counts. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of grief that's rising to scientific notice and public notice, but there's a constant stream now of new findings and new reflections that is very exciting in the sense of a field of study called evolutionary thanatology. And it's also, I think, very moving to think that we are not the only creatures on this earth who feel love and who feel grief and that it's okay and in fact scientifically accurate to use those terms when we refer to other animals. So there has been finding about grief in animals from peccaries, which are pig-like animals, to giraffes, to hippopotamuses, to magpies and monkeys and dairy cows. And the two slide examples I have here do relate to peccaries in the Southwest United States. An elementary school child named Dante Decourt got a camera trap from his grandparents, set it up in his backyard and watched what happened when other peccaries coped with the death of one of their own in a herd. And he ended up putting this information at his elementary school science fair, met scientists and ended up publishing this in a scientific journal. It was absolutely the coolest thing. These things can be sad to witness and to read about. They can remind us of overlapping and entangled type of grief, but they also remind us that animals, again, feel strong, positive feelings for each other. The documentary filmmaker Andrea Arnold put out a couple of years ago a beautiful film called Cow, and in it, she followed the life for some time of a cow held on a dairy farm in the UK named Luma, and you see her picture here. And repeatedly, as happens with most dairy cows, Luma had her sons and daughters taken from her on day one or two after birth because her milk was considered a commodity for humans, not for her offspring. And the movie shows her agitated and pacing and bellowing and trying to defend her children. And it shows her love and it shows her grief. So these findings in animal grief are multiplying all the time because now the scientific world and activists and sanctuary workers and veterinarians and many, many people are looking for them. As we know, what we discover is dependent on the questions that we ask. And we're now looking more and more and more for animal love and animal grief. In my reflection and conception of things, again, there's this kind of doubling of response of feeling sorrow for the animals who themselves grieve, but also feeling a kind of companionship with other animals for knowing that this is an experience that sentient beings have as we live our lives. Now, unlike animal grief, human grief is not a locus of my professional work. I don't work on human grief. But of course, I'm a human and I experience grief and I'm interested in the human experience. And as I 
also have here in parentheses, we are talking about multiple types of grief. Mostly I'm talking about death. And I thought I would just show you my memoir bookshelf that's devoted to grief memoirs and dying memoirs, because I think one way for me to make a connection between the hours that I spend documenting and trying to understand animal grief, to make the connection with what we feel by immersing myself in the very raw writing of humans. One of our species specific ways of expressing grief is through the arts, through writing or dance or painting. And you'll see in this bookshelf some pretty famous memoirs, C.S. Lewis and Joan Didion and Joyce Carol Oates, but you'll see some that are perhaps less well known. On the far right, um, you might see a book called A Heart That Works. You'll see um, one by Amy Bloom, you, and there's a bunch of others as well that are more recent. Next to those are a book with a black spine called Wave, which was an absolutely amazing memoir of a tsunami in Sri Lanka two decades ago by Sonali Dariangala. There are just many things that we can learn about grief through writing. And this is a very important part of my thinking about cross-species grief. I thought I would mention also something called the wind phone, and I'd love to know how many of you are aware of this already. The wind phone originated over 20 years ago now in Japan, and it is just a phone that is not connected to anything. It is a box with a phone that you can pick up with a receiver, but it doesn't go anywhere. It's not electrically connected. And there are now, as you see, over 150 of these in the United States. And the idea is that grieving people may find a wind phone and basically speak their sadness, their yearning, their love into the wind. But it is offered as a way of taking care of each other, of recognizing in a human community that people who are feeling a lot of raw pain need to have a place to go that is safe where they can express themselves. The phone booth at the edge of the world is a novel that tells this story very well that I recommend to you if you don't know it by Laura M. I. Messina. And as you also see on the slide, there's a URL here, www.mywindphone.com. And if you're in the United States, it's possible to look up and see whether there's a wind phone near you. And what I think is so beautiful about this, again, is that it brings us back to the sense of community, of really not pushing down or pushing away grief that exists among us. And I think this is another benefit of seeing that grief is a cross-species phenomenon, that it happens continuously, it's all around us, and that it can become very freeing to think of it in that way. Ecological grief has been defined by Consolo and Ellis in an article in Nature Climate Change five years ago as grief felt in relation to experienced or anticipated ecological losses, including the loss of species, ecosystems, and meaningful landscapes due to acute or chronic environmental change. So here, of course, I refer to the global warming that I know is on our minds. And I found it very useful to have a kind of codification of this sense that so many of us have that we are in the middle of experiencing losses. And on top of that, aware that the natural world itself is experiencing change. And when there are sentient animals as part of that natural landscape, they are affected very much as well. If you'll bear with one more text heavy slide, Consulo and Ellis in their article discuss a link between climate related changes and a whole range of acute and chronic mental health experiences. This ranges from fear and anger and despair to elevated rates of mood disorders, including depression, anxiety, PTSD, and increased suicidal ideation. They also link ecological grief with threats and disruptions to sense of place and place attachment and loss of personal or cultural identity and ways of knowing. In their article, they talk about the extreme impact of ecological grief on certain groups 
who are very, very connected to the land, for example, farm families, farming communities, very many indigenous families, indigenous leaders, and others, of course, as well. And I think then, as I mentioned before, that these three levels of, of grief do inform each other and they may inform our activism. Everything that we think about now that's future related is also climate crisis related. And the question really before us, when we think about ecological grief is which future are we going to end up with? Which grief, which level of grief will we end up with? And you see here an example of three types of futures, depending on how much global warming is allowed, the 1.5 to 3C increase in temperatures in global warming. So again, we have these multi-level phenomena, knowing that in fact, due to anthropogenic harms, animals may grieve more, humans may grieve more for each other and for the earth. The climate book, which came out earlier this year in the United States, is comprised of 84 chapters from climate scientists and activists that I found both sobering and hopeful. And I do think that when we talk about topics like this, there's a centrality for the concept of hope and communication and talking about the fact that there is time to make change, there is room to make change. And this book edited by Greta Thunberg includes a focus on climate justice via indigenous contributors. And they taught me a lot. So I thought I would just mention that. So in my work, which deals most directly with animal grief, I join with others in the more than human anthropology community to bridge scholarship and activism. This has long been an active subfield in both biological and cultural anthropology. For example, some years ago in a beautiful book called How Forests Think, Eduardo Cohn wrote, the world beyond the human is not a meaningless one made meaningful by humans. And I think for activists that really resounds deeply that we know that we are part of an ecological community, but that this is a co-created community. And at the same time, we know that due to humans outsized power in terms of global warming, there are also inequities in that ecological community. So there's been a very promising and engaging recent focus on multi-species justice and activism. And I give you one example here, The Promise of Multi-Species Justice, a volume edited by Sophie Chow, Karen Bolander, and Eben Kirksey. And so I think that for me, the weaving together of the knowledge that we bring in terms of understanding other animal lives and the actions that we take in surrounding other animal lives with our care and our compassion together entangle and become very, very powerful. I have worked quite a bit on cogn cognition and emotion in other than human animals, asking the question who thinks and who feels, and of course, very many animals think and feel. So the question really becomes, how do they think and how do they feel? And one thing that I've noticed is that there's a kind of parallel to what I talked about earlier. When I mentioned animal grief, I mentioned that big brain mammals like orcas, or we could talk about chimpanzees or elephants, their grief tends to get noticed. Or our human companions like cats and dogs or even horses tend to get noticed. But other species are not the central focus. Well, there's a parallel situation in the study of cognition and emotion and the public response to that study. So if there's a new finding about something that elephants do, a problem solving approach or a deep emotion that's expressed, or let's say in our dogs, as you know, the canine cognition is a huge field of endeavor right now. This tends to get big headlines. It tends to get a lot of attention and people feel excited and they want to work to help these species. But there's a lot of other species, too, who think and who feel but get fewer headlines and may not be 
really at the center of that type of attention. It may be at our center as activists, but there may not be that support from sort of society and from science. And I have pictures here of octopuses and farmed pigs to make that point. And I'll be coming back to octopuses later. But I think it's very helpful to understand that the scientific community is making strides in the study of cognition and emotion for all of these species, and that they can inspire us to think about why we're doing what we're doing and to make it very clear that our work is important. Now, we have very strong evidence of grieving elephants. We have strong evidence of grieving dogs. We have evidence of grief in farmed animals, including pigs. And we don't in octopuses. Is that because we haven't looked yet? Is that because they don't grieve? I mean, these are open-ended questions. And of course, as an activist, I'm not making the argument that we only wanna protect animals who have recognizable grief. That is not my argument, but rather that is something that's exciting to continue to think about in the future. And I would just make a comment here, again, coming from my field, but not in any way tied to only anthropology. This wonderful graphic book produced by Watterson and Corden in the field of anthropology makes this point that engaged anthropologists ask, what can my discipline offer the world in order to address a wide range of issues of profound public importance? And that again, goes across many, many disciplines. And I think what I'm here to say and to join all of you here in saying is that animal lives are part of those issues of profound public importance. And so what you know I'm trying to do is walk that world, that line between the worlds of scholarship on animals and public communication about the meaning of what we're learning for the lives of other animals. I wanted to slip one slide in here and to say that Sometimes I'll mention anthropogenic harms or I'll mention, you know, the public responds this way or that way. And the indigenous scientist and writer Robin Wall Kimmerer reminds us in Braiding Sweetgrass, in Potawatomi and most other indigenous languages, we use the same words to address the living world as we use for our family because they are our family. And for anthropologists and activists both, across disciplines again, we need to take care how we use the term we, because we tend to speak as if all societies are the same or as if everybody was raised in a particular Western cosmology, which of course is not the case. And more and more the indigenous science and indigenous wisdom that comes from the communities in our world are informing others of us too. So just as animal and human grief is linked to love, so too, I believe, is ecological grief. When we see what's happening to our either hyper-local environments where we live or our planet as a whole, that can become a source of sorrow for us. So as we work to help others, and that is, of course, the very definition of activism, that we are working for other than human animals and human communities alike, it may be a kind of double emotional hit for us because first of all, we find our own peace, happiness, and solace in relating with animals and with the natural world. And we know at the same time that these changes are happening. So I think it's very important to try to hold in mind that there's this, again, complicated sort of layered phenomenon going on where the very things and the very beings that give us strength and wisdom and solace can also be a source, as we know, of, of emotional pain. And we're all aware of this as we work in the activism community. And this is important for me as a professional and as an activist, and it's true, I believe, for anyone who co-constructs a life with animals. So just a brief personal interlude here. Uh, we live with cats. We have rescued cats, as I mentioned. This is our youngest, Marie, at age 12 and just Four hours ago, we were at the vet with her because she's developed a new uh, seizure disorder, which has been concerning us. And I take so much, so much strength and inspiration from seeing other animals as the individuals who they are and learn from them 
about different ways of being in the world and pushing back against human exceptionalism, the idea that the way we do things is the most superior or most sophisticated or the most intricate way, which I do not believe is the case. And I have been thinking a great deal about the animals in my yard in the last three to five years. I've developed a very, very strong need and emotional need to feel that first of all, I'm making as much of a sanctuary of my yard as I can for other animals and realize at the same time that it is a sanctuary for me that enables me to learn about animals and to become better equipped to go out into the world to help other animals. So just a few of my extremely amateur nature for photographs. This is a northern flicker from the oak tree in our front yard and one of our five resident box turtles in our backyard. We're very happy to have a small community of these native turtles. Here you see a male. You can tell that from the red eyes. And we have rabbits and squirrels and possums and spiders and I, so many types of birds and snakes. This is a black rat snake. And I think what I'm trying to say here is that when I watch these animals day after day, week after week, month after month, in certain cases, recognizing individuals and not others, I realize that all this work that I do on documenting grief and love and joy and fear, I'm not doing that when I'm part of my yard, but I know that it's happening. I know that this is a whole multi-species ecosystem that I'm just part of. And that when this snake or that bird or that turtle goes off to do what he or she does the rest of the day, she or he can have a good day or a bad day. And that we can make a difference in pushing that towards a good day. So doing just simple things in my yard, like making sure I don't rake all the leaves and don't use fertilizer and don't mow the grass down to the bottom and have places where animals can hide in the bush, the brush and just do whatever we can. It gives me this, the, the idea that we can multiply this care for other animals. And I wanted to, to sort of move into the conclusion by mentioning that this is a very important week for octopus activism to give a very specific point. And to, for me to understand that there is a connection between knowing that other animals love and grieve and not knowing very much about octopus but wanting very passionately to see them for who they are and protect them however they are in the world. Now you see here an octopus named the professor who lived at the New England Aquarium in Boston. And I have very mixed feelings about this photograph because it shows a captive octopus. And we can talk about that again later if you'd like. The reason I'm here in this photograph is because the aquarist told me that meeting new and sympathetic human beings are an enrichment for individual octopuses who are given the choice to come forward or not completely under their own decision making and meet a person. So I basically stood there and this wonderful male called the professor chose to meet me on his own. And the expression on my face, I really think reflects the awe that I felt because after this picture was taken, he wrapped one of his arms around mine and I knew that he wasn't just tasting me, but that he was using his distributed brain and all the neurons in those arms to think about me in some way. And I don't fully understand that way, but what an extremely wonderful moment it is that I think ignites all of us when we have those moments of connection. And on Saturday, it happens to be an international day of protest against the plan for the world's first octopus farm that you may have heard of that is scheduled to be built in Spain. And if it is built, it will quote unquote process 1 million octopuses for food, basically for a luxury market. And we are having a day of protest to which I will contribute on Saturday. And I wanted to give you that example because I think that it is, again, important to say that grief can be difficult at all three levels, looking at other animals grieving, feeling grief ourselves, and looking at grief at the world and seeing what's happening to the planet. But what we do to speak up for others is so, I think, truly empowering and so important to know that we are part of a community of thinkers and doers across the whole globe. 
So there are two books that I have found very helpful in thinking about the changing planet that we live on, Erosion by Terry Tempest Williams and Mourning in the Anthropocene by Joshua Trey Bennett. And they are important because they give us paths forward. Terry Tempest Williams says about the changing earth that our undoing is also our becoming. And I believe what she means is that there are ways to forge new connections, new networks, and new patterns, even as we are in the moments of loss. And I think that this is important to remember regarding activism too, that we are constantly becoming together as a community. So I would end with a slide of pictures taken from Yellowstone, and of course, jumping off into the discussion to think about how we can help ourselves and each other. And I truly do believe that understanding more about the animal communities we care about so much is a central part of helping ourselves and helping each other so that we share joys and traumas together as well as resources. We remember that sharing our successful work is not the unseemly self-promotion it's sometimes made out to be. It's important. It's what we do and it matters. And that, of course, we act for the beings and the worlds that we love. So I'd like very much to move into a discussion and to ask if there are questions and go from there and talk about what you'd like to talk about. All right. Thank you, Barbara. I have a million questions. <laughs> um, but we're opening it up for questions that now in the chat or or comments or areas where you'd like Barbara to go a little bit deeper uh, into. And we'll look for those. Otherwise, I'm going to ask some questions. And um, we would like to discuss this very, 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 very rich topic. So go ahead and put your questions in the chat. And while we're waiting for that, Elena, do you have any questions or comments for Barbara to start? Oh, I do. I have uh, quite a few things on my mind. Barbara, thank you so much for your wondrous presentation and, you know, weaving together these ideas of um, all this different type of grief and how it lives in our day-to-day -day lives, whether it's, you know, the griefs, like you mentioned with other humans and, and animals and the ecological side, it's really interesting to see how they can come together and how they act on their own. Um, you don't see questions in the chat just yet. So I guess I wanted to go ahead and um, talk a bit further about the idea of not condoning recognizable grief. That really stuck out to me. And I think to put it into greater context, you mentioned um, in the relation to octopi and how um, it seems like if that, you know, tends to be the case that it kind of slides into the more um, anthropomorphizing realm. Uh, if we do try and look at um, an individual who we're not as commonly in relation with, you know, those who live in the ocean, for instance, um, you know, trying to recognize their grief would be vastly different for me um, than recognizing the grief of um, a cat family member. So I just wanted to check, does that seem to be on the right track? And could you talk a little more about that? Because I found it fascinating and it's something that's been on my mind. Okay, a couple of things. Trained in science as I am, I also want to keep open the possibility that there are animals who don't grieve. Not only that we find it hard to recognize, but perhaps they don't grieve. And that would not make them in any way lesser beings. So I think the possibility of absent grief is, first of all, very fascinating because that can inhere at any level. I mean, there are dogs who lose a companion who do not grieve, monkeys who lose a companion who do grieve or who don't grieve. So it's not just the idea that, you know, there are certain beings who don't grieve, but it's a very, very variable phenomenon. But I think we should look. That's what I'm suggesting. So 
the question comes to mind, we'll stick with the example of octopuses. How would we recognize grief in an animal who flashes moods across her skin using specialized you know, cells? So if there's an excited octopus versus a very depressed octopus, that is in certain ways visible to us. And I think that it is very possible to contextualize excitement or sadness in an octopus by looking at the quality of their movements and that we can do that by not just acting as if, well, this is what we would do. I think it's possible to separate what we would do and just learn about the biology and the environment and the learning capacities of a species. And so that might be one way to potentially look for grief by looking at the expression of colors across the body, as well as say things like social withdrawal and, and hiding in a crevice, something like this. But it's difficult to know whether anthropomorphism comes into play or not, because anthropomorphism is a projection of human qualities. And my argument is that grief and love aren't human qualities. So I would tend to keep a very open mind about two things and separating anthropomorphism from the imposition of a human standard. So they're different because I think anthropomorphism is basically saying, well, we're going to assume that some animal acts in the way that humans would. But when we look at all these giraffes and hippopotamuses and dogs and crows and orcas and cats, we see that sometimes there is an overlap between how we act and how other animals act. So I don't know that anthropomorphism is so much the concern that I have, but it's stopping with the components of grief that we recognize. That's what I don't want to do. So even if we go and look at chimpanzees in the wild, let's say, and we don't just look for what we do, sometimes at a death, there may be a community surrounding a chimpanzee doing some things that we might have expected, grooming, touching the body. And sometimes a chimpanzee will start displaying and using objects and acting in a very raucous and even slightly aggressive manner. And that ap appears to be a type of grief expression in chimpanzees. So in that case, we just want to say that we're not going to judge that as somehow inappropriate because it is perfectly appropriate for the species. Now, I think that's a way of addressing your question. I'm not sure it answers it directly, but I, I want to just be a little, a little bit of a little bit of a critical community together thinking about what anthropomorphism means. Because I tend to think People worry about it. And it may not be something to worry about as much as only limiting ourselves to looking for human expression. Does that make sense to you, Elena? It, it does. And it brings me back to what you bring up in your book, How Animals Grieve, is, you know, the idea of, you know, we can clarify grief versus absent grief as behavior that is markedly different than what that individual previously would do. And so in that case, anthropomorphism, you know, there would be no concern because we're not taking it from that lens. We're taking it from, based on these observations, they differ from what I'm now seeing with this individual and what I know about that species specific uh -huh. knowledge base that I have. And the absence of grief is, a very important for us to learn both at the species level, like which individuals in this particular circumstance have emergent grief that's visible to us and, and which do not. And are there species where there's simply a complete absence of grief? And of course, I imagine there are. I mean, if I, I'm so enamored of spiders, for example, I think they're thinking invertebrates. I think that they may have some type of temperament differences between individuals. None of that seems outrageous to me. Do I, would I hypothesize that they grieve? Not necessarily. They have a very different, intricate, spectacular, wonderful approach to their lives. So there you go. 
Thank so we you. have a question in the chat, Barbara, then. Um, have you seen the film My Octopus Teacher? And if so, any general thoughts on that? I know it was on Netflix. I loved My Octopus Teacher. And I'm so happy to see that Craig Foster is bringing out a book next year in 2024, um, which I'm very happily already asked to review. I liked My Octopus Teacher because, of course, what you have in that case is a diver entering into an octopus's habitat, so different than what we'll usually ask of other animals to enter our world if, for example, we keep them captive in zoos or in other situations. So the idea of spending time to learn an animal's ways of being in his or her own habitat, especially in a place like underwater, is an amazing commitment. I was very impressed. And I also think it touched a chord in, in humans that is absolutely critical for our activism, but also everybody's compassion. You know, I mentioned octopus industrial farming and the very loud worldwide outcry against it. There is also a new move to have octopuses be the new laboratory animal, which I think is equally wrong, equally harmful, equally anthropocentric. And so I do strongly believe that people come to care more when they know more about animals. And my octopus teacher did a huge, wonderful um, task in that way. Another question in the chat from Deborah. Um, and I'm not familiar with this, but the story of Lawrence Anthony and how the herd he rescued came from quite a long distance to honor him shortly after he left his body. She'd love to hear your perspective on how they knew he passed. You know, um, if I could try to remember this, there was a very important, kind, uh, compassionate man, Lawrence Anthony, who acted for animals, including elephants, and he died too young. And the story goes that from many, many miles away, elephants traveled to, I believe, his home. I honestly don't have a comment on this because it is something that I don't understand. And I think that that's kind of a wonderful thing in some ways that animals do things that may be beyond our understanding. And I don't mean that in a mystical way. I mean it in a scientific way that we have questions that we don't understand. I mean, some people are suggesting that there was some kind of transfer of information across miles to these elephants and what that could be, I cannot guess. Others are suggesting that the only scientific approach to answering that question is to think of it as an amazing coincidence. I just don't know. Maybe the answers are more on a spiritual level or a metaphysical level in that regard, and we can't know. So, yes, well, I think working in a scientific framework, I think the 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 answer is that from science, we just we just don't know the answer to that. And you know, mm -hmm. I'm I'm I don't extend into a spiritual realm, but you know, others may wish to do that. Yes. So we're open st certainly still for, for more questions. More questions are welcome. I have a question in the meantime as well. Um, do you, th how important is it to allow our companion animals or our bonded com companion animals who are bonded with other animals when one passes um, to witness, to be around, um, how does it affect them when they're not allowed to be in the space when a, another bonded animal with them? Um, how does that affect them? I'm thinking, of course, in animal agriculture and on farms. And how do they know when death has occurred? Is it mostly smell? Is it what they observe? So wow. How well, that's a lot, Michelle. Let me try to take part of it. Yeah. Um, I think that there is a growing movement across zoos, sanctuaries, veterinarian offices, and private homes to allow animals to see the dead body of a companion. Now, this certainly 
is a very different type of situation. We're talking about um, a place where there is love and concern when an animal dies. So I'm not going to extend this to a place like a slaughterhouse at this moment. I'm just talking about places where there's concern for a survivor. We do this now routinely by whenever we can, by letting our cats see the body of another cat. I think it's important um, for animal companions whenever possible because it's otherwise, <coughs> excuse me, as if, you know, you take an animal to the vet, for example, and you have three cats in the home and then the fourth one doesn't come back. And I cannot imagine what that's like when there's no physical concrete evidence, excuse me, of what happened. So the idea that animals can recognize death is gaining, gaining a lot of scientific credence. And it seems to me very clear that we would expect the cues to be coming from a dead body simply in the sense of the stillness, the lack of movement, the appearance of the body, multimodal, yes, sense, the touch, everything. I think there are very, very many animals who can recognize death. And I'm basing this conclusion partly on personal experience and partly on the work of Susan Monceau, M-O-N-S-O. And if you don't know her work, it's very much worth reading. But the real outstanding question, I think, is one that you asked, Michelle, is that, is there a benefit to the animal versus a harm if the animal is not allowed to have that experience? In other words, what's the difference to the survivor? And we don't really, to my knowledge, have controlled studies because it would really require something that would be quite difficult given, given both species and individual variation, having lots and lots of animals tested in a controlled situation with, you know, this time they see the body of a, of a dead friend, this time they don't, what is the difference? And there would be so many variables that would differ between the two, even when you tried to control them, that I think it would be very hard to know. The way that I look at it is that we don't know the specific set of benefits of letting this happen, and we don't know the specific set of costs without letting it happen. But there, there is no downside to offering the opportunity to animals. I mentioned earlier in this talk that Kaylee the cat chose not to come forward to touch or gaze closely at her sister's body. And I felt that it was sort of a mark of interspecies respect to make sure that she could come close or not come close. In other words, she was not confined in a small space with the body. She did exactly what she wanted to do. Was that because it was too upsetting for her to come closer? I don't know. But I think the idea is to give a lot of choice and never to force. And then whatever happens perhaps will help and that that is good enough for me as an argument to do that. Of course, my activism work tends to focus right now a lot on animals held in biomedical laboratories and in that context, as well as in slaughterhouses, you know, this doesn't even really compute, right? I mean, animals sense death and suffering and injury all around them in these contexts and they cannot escape it. And so I don't think that there is I mean, the, the situation is just so different. It is not presenting an animal with death in a compassionate context. It is a suffering context, something that they can't escape. So I find them to be incomparable situations. Absolutely, such differences across the spectrum. Very good though. So there is a question here in the chat then. Um, so since some humans are more logically minded and some are more emotionally minded, how do you approach the topic of uh, non-human people's grieving with the more logically minded? I think talking about emotions is not necessarily incompatible with logic because we're talking about evolution of emotion. So what I might do is put the conversation in a more explicitly evolutionary context, talking about the fact 
that emotions enable animals to survive and flourish and thrive and they're necessary evolutionarily. And so emotions are just the way that living beings are built to different degrees and in different ways. And I think that making a kind of appeal to understanding that any sentient being is composed of you know, thoughts and feelings, because this is the way that life evolves, might be somewhat helpful. So I don't think of writing about emotions as appealing only to people's emotions. I see it as appealing to a sense of understanding what it means to be a living organism making his or her way in the world, solving problems. And we know that emotion and cognition are really intricately related so that they're not really separable in an individual's life. So I think making those kinds of points might be helpful. And I also do very, very explicitly talk about the fact that why do we want to know how animals think and feel? To me, it's not simply a matter of curiosity and knowledge for its own sake, which is important, but it's to apply that knowledge to be able to help them better. I mean, for me, it comes back very literally and specifically to being a better activist. You know, if I understand something about those turtles that live in my backyard and have lived there for decades and have, were there before I was there probably and will be there after I was there, I can do things to, to help them. And the same thing is true of the octopuses and the orcas that I don't have in my backyard. And I think that counts as a logical framework. So yeah, that's a great to to bring it into the day to day. Like um, most of us here listening to you don't have the the storage space capacity for all of this knowledge that you have. So what would be sort of you know to to potentially sway people to un, to have more empathy or to at least to begin to consider the experience of sent, other sentient, non-human sentient beings? Would it be storytelling? Would it be like you, when you talk about the is that what we might do in outreach to talk about the turtles in our backyard or the our you know how our cats responded to each other when one was lost? Um, well, I you think you're quite right to bring up storytelling, and I have a binary response to that because you know on the sadder side, we know that for how many years now scientists and activists have joined together in storytelling about say farmed animals and we know that meat consumption goes up. And so it can be discouraging to know that storytelling doesn't bring about the results that we would hope for. And so I, on some days that is a weight that we carry. On the other hand, we just talked about movies like My Octopus Teacher. We also know that there's absolute fascination with the animal world in books, in movies, in safari experiences. And I don't mean that just in terms of, say, going to Africa, as I was lucky enough to do, but just going into national parks and state parks. And I think the idea is to be able to move fluidly between talking about protecting ecosystems, which is so very much important, but always, always remembering the role of individuals. Because I think generally people do respond more when you can connect them to specific individuals. And I would like to see specifically a lot more of that around farmed animals, including fishes, because fishes are individuals, you know, we, we don't tend to think of them always, we tend to think of a school of fish, but what we're learning about individual fishes is very, very fascinating. So I think there's a whole opportunity there for some of the less well written and filmed about animals to talk about this double need think of ecosystems but also think of individuals and i hope that might make a difference so we're open are you okay barbara to take see if there's a couple more a few more questions okay no? so we're at eight o'clock we're at eight o'clock yeah 
I have lots more questions, Elena. But do you? Know <laughs> I can I can Bogart the entire time with Barbara. <laughs> do you have Elena? Did you want to make any comments? Or no? Oh, I wanted to mention I appreciate your mentioning of you know um, applying what you've learned to the folks who live you know, in your ecosystem, in your backyard. I think that's something that oftentimes can be overlooked. You know, we do live within these ecosystems and, you know, whether we live in an urban sprawl or in a rural area, I think there's always opportunities for connection and for us to create a sense of belonging with other beings as we grow to know who they are as individuals and on a, a species level and, um, grow to have that appreciation. And um, I think that's becoming more prevalent, like here in the Denver area, they're, um, you know, and putting up a food forest all over the city. We have lots of community gardens. We have wonderful parks. We have, um, you know, wonderful opportunities to, you know, be outdoors. That is very cool. And I think more and more schools are, or should be, you know, bringing kids out to such places from a really young age. You know, I've been very moved by reading about the Norwegian forest schools. I have a former student who is living in Norway and has on and off for some years, whose young child is, you know, kindergarten outside most of the time, no matter what the weather is. And some of the United States schools follow that. And even if we don't go to that kind of extreme, just bringing kids you know, from wherever they live into the parks in their area. And certainly that's as true in New York City as it is in, say, you know, Southwestern Desert. When the pandemic started, I did what I think a bunch of people did and started looking even more than I had been at the animals in my yard. And I was astonished to find that there are over 50 species of bird that come to my yard over the seasons in a year. And honestly, I never would have expected that if I hadn't sort of opened up this new avenue of inquiry, you know, even in my 60s, just finding out that I wanted to keep lists of birds. And again, what that does is it just opens up my eyes to different ways of being in the world that I truly think does connect not only to my own sense of peace and calm on hard days, but to activism, to practice that way of seeing other beings and other ways of being and to think, well, this is something that I'd never thought of before that an animal could do. And I see something in my yard and then I look it up. I read about it. I look, to, look at a video about it. So it is that that wonderful duality of giving a gift to me and then my trying to turn it into a way to understand something better to give it back. And that goes way beyond grieving, but it does, again, fit into those categories, right, of recognizing animal emotion by recognizing how we handle grief and by recognizing what we need to do to cope with ecological grief. So I do think that these entanglements keep coming up all the time. So we have some comments. I want to make sure that you are hearing some of the great comments that are in the uh, chat, Barbara. Also, Testify Redeems says animals navigate the world in their own way. It shouldn't necessarily be compared to the way we navigate. They're intelligent in a specific way. Yep. And also, uh, this has been great. Barbara has a great perspective and a great way of conveying it. And ethically based ex omnivore says even the term fish removes their individuality as a way to devalue them to product status. Right. Right. One reason why I said fishes is it starts moving us in the direction of realizing that, yes, I, I agree. And it, the same is true of, you know, lumping animals together as invertebrates. I mean, we do a lot of that. I think specificity is very helpful. My my new life being smitten with spiders, I try to specify if I'm talking about an orb weaver or a, a jumping spider, a saltacid, or you know something like that, because I think that the idea of lumping them all together as bugs is not going to get us where we want to go. So, so thank you very much. I've enjoyed talking with all of you. I appreciate your attention. 
Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to just mention one more time, as you kindly did at the beginning, that if you have um, a wish to contact me or to know more about what I'm doing, my website is www.barbarajking.com, and I can be found there. Thank you, Barbara, so much. We'll make sure to put that in the in the in the comments so that people can reach out to you and really follow your work. Thank you. And we're so appreciative of your time. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. So, um, Elena, then any, I'm going to, I'm going to wrap up, but any other points there? I'm inspired. So Barbara, uh, to mimic what Michelle and others have said, thank you so much for your time today. I'm so grateful. Yeah, and we have Barbara's books in the in the in the comments as well, so folks can certainly read and follow her work as well. Um, but absolutely, I'm I'm inspired as well. And oh, you're muted. Did you want? To... You have to unmute through Zoom though. Michelle, are you talking to me? Oh, yeah, I was. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so I'm going to wrap up. So I'm just going to announce a few of our upcoming uh, workshops that will be back. On November 10th, we have plant-based diets for animal companion animals. On November 16th, we have the plant-based treaty. On November 30th, we have media relations and strategic marketing for your animal rights campaign or cause. And on December 12th, we have effective communication skills for activists. And also, please check out all our previous workshops right here on our YouTube channel. And please make sure that you subscribe and hit the bell to get notified of all of our new content. Um, also, please consider becoming a patron by finding AAM on Patreon. Your donations allow AAM to continue to provide free educational resources for activists, which ultimately saves more animals. That's it. That wraps up another workshop. Thank you all for Barbara, even though she is not with us any longer, but we're so appreciative of her time and wisdom. I'm uh, here. I'm here. I'm oh, listening. okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you so much again. Awesome. Awesome job. Um, Thank you, everyone. And again, I can visit animalactivismmentorship.com. Um, visit our website and join us again. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks. Living in. Thank you.